Continuing our study of inverse trigonometric functions, we're going to look at the inverse cosine function. Just like for the sine function, if you look at the graph of the cosine function, it is clear that this is not a one-to-one -one function. If we look at the horizontal line test, for each horizontal line that intersects the graph, it does, in fact, infinitely many times. So cosine is not a one-to-one -one function. However, just like for the sine function, we can consider an appropriate restriction of the cosine function to an interval on which it is 1 to 1. As a convention, we're going to pick this interval from 0 to pi. And even though the cosine function is not 1 to 1, its restriction to this interval 0 pi is, and therefore we can consider the inverse function of this restriction. And that's what we're going to call the inverse cosine function, denoted r cos. So I use r cosine with the same convention as before. Um, sometimes in your book you will see cosine to the power of negative 1 to denote the inverse cosine function. We do not use this convention here um, for the reason that we outlined when we discussed the inverse sine function. So because this is the uh, inverse function of the restriction of cosine to the closed interval 0 pi, that means that y is r cosine of x, if and only if the cosine of y is x, and y is between 0 and pi. In other words, r cosine of x is the angle between 0 and pi, whose cosine is x. So because r cosine and cosine, at least the restriction to 0 pi, are inverse of each other. If I plug cosine x into r cosine, I get x, as long as x is between 0 and pi. If it's not between 0 and pi, we will have to adjust. And if I plug r cosine x into a cosine, I get x for any x in the domain of r cosine, which is, of course, from negative 1 to 1, because this is the range of cosine. So that means that, for instance, if I plug cosine of pi over 5 into an r cosine, I get pi over 5 because pi over 5 is an, an angle between 0 and pi. On the other hand, if I was to look at r cosine of cosine 6 pi over 5, then you see that 6 pi over 5 is greater than pi, so uh, x here is not in the interval 0 pi. So to adjust, we look at the trig circle, look at where 6 pi over 5 is, and what we want is an angle between 0 and pi, in other words, on the blue part, uh, of the trig circle that has the same cosine and in this case you see that 4 pi over 5 is the only angle between 0 and pi that has the same cosine as 6 pi over 5. So in that case to calculate uh, what we're looking at we replace cosine 6 pi over 5 by cosine pi, 4 pi over 5 and this time 4 pi over 5 is between 0 and pi so we can apply uh, the fact that r cosine and the restriction of cosine to 0 pi are inverse of each other to the effect that uh, the value of this, of this um, expression is 4 pi over 5. Now what about the derivative of this r cosine function? So we're trying to differentiate y where y is r cosine x. But y equal r cosine x by definition means that cosine of y is x and y is between 0 and pi. So we can differentiate cosine y with respect to x, and that's the derivative of x, in other words, it's 1. Now y is a function of x, I differentiate cosine y with respect to x, so I use the chain rule, get the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, evaluated at y, but I have to multiply that by the derivative of y. So I obtain negative sine of y multiplied by the derivative of y with respect to x. That means dy over dx is negative 1 over sine y. So we want to express this in terms of x because we want the derivative of y, of r cosine x, as a function of x. But cosine square y plus sine square y is 1, so sine square y is 1 minus cosine square y. And cosine y is x, so that's really 1 minus x squared. So we have at this point that dy over dx is negative 1 over sine y, where the square of sine y is 1 minus x squared. But additionally, we know that y is between 0 and pi, 
And if y is between 0 and pi, then its sine is positive. Therefore, if sine square y is 1 minus x square, sine y is the root of 1 minus x square, because we know that sine y is positive. So replacing in this formula, we obtain that dy over dx is negative 1 over square root of 1 minus x square. But y here was just arc cosine of x, so we obtain that the derivative of arc cosine of x is negative 1 over square root of 1 minus x square. Well, that looks a lot like what we have obtained for arc sine. Specifically, the derivative of arc sine was 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared, so just the opposite. One way to look at that um, is to think of this function 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. One entire derivative of that function is arc sine of x. Another one is negative arc cosine of x, because if arc cosine has for derivative the opposite of the function, then opposite of arc cosine is going to have as a derivative 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. So these are two antiderivatives of the same function, arc sine x and negative arc cosine, on the interval negative 1, 1. That means that they differ only by a constant. In other words, arc sine of x is equal to negative arc cosine of x up to some constant c. And we can calculate this constant by, for instance, plugging x equals 0 arc sine of 0 is going to be 0 and arc cosine of 0 is going to be pi over 2 right? because this is the angle between 0 and pi where the cosine is 0 and therefore we obtain that 0 is negative pi over 2 plus c that is the constant c is pi over 2 and we obtain the formula that the sum of arc sine x and arc cosine x is pi over 2. Let's look at the graph now. Uh, if I look at the restriction of cosine x to the interval 0 pi, that is drawn in black uh, on this picture, I know that to obtain the graph of the inverse function, I need to take the reflection of that graph about y equal x. So we draw the line y equal x here in green and take the reflection of the black graph about this green line and we obtain the red graph which is a graph of arc cosine x. You see that uh, it has domain negative 1 1 and range 0 pi as expected. So getting rid of the clutter this is what we obtain. Uh, function defined from negative 1 to 1 range 0 pi takes the value pi over 2 at 0 and if you compare with the graph that we had found for arc sine, you can see um, how these two graphs are related. In fact, uh, this formula that we just have established, that arc sine x plus arc cosine x is equal to pi over 2, one way to look at it is that arc cosine x is pi over 2 minus arc sine x. In other words, to obtain the, the graph of arc cosine, take the graph of arc sine, then cons construct the graph of negative arc sine, and for that you just flip the graph about the x-axis, and then add pi over 2, and for that you just pull the graph up by pi over 2. And clearly this is what you obtain. Now let's turn to the inverse tangent function. The tangent function uh, is not defined on the entire real line. We have to uh, take off the... Uh, pi over 2 plus a multiple of pi. So in particular, negative pi over 2, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and so on. At these values, uh, the tangent is not defined because tangent is sine x over cosine x, and the cosine is 0 at this value. So this is what the graph looks like. And of course, if you take an horizontal line, you see that it intersects the graph infinitely many times. So that means the tangent function is not 1 to 1. However, we can again take an appropriate restriction of the tangent function on an interval where it is 1 to 1. And in this case, the natural choice is uh, the period of the uh, tangent function that is centered at 0.
Specifically, the interval negative pi over 2 pi over 2, where of course we exclude the endpoints where the tangent is not defined. So this restriction is 1 to 1, and therefore we can consider its inverse function, and that's what we're going to, to call the inverse tangent function, and denote by arctan. So because it is the inverse function of the restriction of the tangent function 2 negative pi over 2 pi over 2, that means that y is arctangent x, by definition, if tangent of y is x and y is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and points excluded. So, if we look at the graph, uh, we're looking at the inverse function of the restriction of tangent to negative pi over 2 pi over 2. So we can look at this um, graph of this restriction. This is the black curve, y equal tangent x, only between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and the two vertical asymptotes uh, for this function are drawn as x equal negative pi over 2 and x equal pi over 2. And to get the inverse function, we need to get the reflection of this graph about y equal x. So we draw y equal x, here it's the line in green, and take the reflection of the black graph about that line, we obtain the red graph, which is a graph of arctangent. Getting rid of the clutter, this is what we obtain. And you see that the vertical asymptotes for tangent become horizontal asymptotes for arctangent. So in particular, y equal negative pi over 2 and y equal pi over 2 are two horizontal asymptotes for arctangent. Arctangent has domain negative infinity infinity, because that was a range of tangent, and the range is the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And you see that when x goes to infinity, arctangent approaches pi over 2 from below, and when x approaches negative infinity, arctangent approaches negative pi over 2 from above. One more observation is that because the tangent function is odd, that means um, the origin is a center of symmetry for the graph. This property is preserved by reflection about y equal x, and therefore arctangent is also odd. As you can see from the graph, uh, the origin here is the center of symmetry for the curve. What about the derivative of arctangent? So we take y equal arctangent x and we want dy over dx. y equal arctangent x really means that the tangent of y is x, and so we can differentiate this expression with respect to x. Specifically, the derivative of tangent of y with respect to x is the derivative of x, in other words, is 1. Derivative of tangent is usually written as secant squared, but another way to write it is 1 plus tangent squared. So here I have tangent of some function of x, I use the chain rule. I'm going to get 1 plus tangent squared of that function y and then I have to multiply that by the derivative of y. So here is what I obtain, y, 1 plus tangent square y multiplied by dy dx, and that should equal 1. Now because tangent y is x, I can replace tangent square y by x square, and we obtain that dy over dx is 1 over 1 plus x square. But y was arctangent x, so what we have obtained is that the derivative of arctangent x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. One way to look at this formula, of course, is just to turn it around and see that arctangent x is an antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared. In other words, the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is arctangent x. And here we have a summary of what we have seen about the arctangent function the limits at negative and positive infinity, domain and range, what the graph looks like, in particular it's a not function, and these formulas. Now we could talk about the uh, arc secant, arc cosecant, arc cotangent um, established formula just the same way as what we have done for cosine, sine and tangent. These are functions that are uh, much less used and therefore we are not going to uh, include this study uh, at this point. You can refer to your book if you want the formula. Now let's, not, let's turn to the next video to see how to apply these formulas to problems about derivatives and integrals.